Hub Online. We are so glad you guys could join us. We just started the show and we're so glad you're here. Tonight's going to be an awesome show. We've got for the GMI online discussion, we're going to talk about fundraising today and we've got some amazing guests. My name is Dale Borland. And I'm Cheryl Duick, and I have the pleasure of uh, introducing you to our lovely ladies who you are seeing on our screens right now. We have, on one side, we have Faith Amore, who is an award-winning singer, composer, conductor, educator, and jazz recording artist from Toronto. She provides consulting and to beginning artists and organizations in the area of marketing. So welcome, Faith. So glad you can be here with us. Thanks so much. Nice to be here. Thank you. And Oh, excellent. And on the other side, we have Joy Laps Lewis, educator of music and academics and arts. Is that correct? Yep. And, musician yep. As well. and a musician as well. She's actually steel plan player. Yes. 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 So we have Joy here and, and Joy is known to be very, very entrepreneurial when it comes to music. So we welcome you, Joy. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you. It's so good to have you girls today. Um, let's start off by finding a bit more about you, if we could, besides the introduction we have. Let's start off with Faith. Give us a little idea of what you're doing right now and uh, what, what was happening in your life. Well, right now is an uh, unusual time, so <laughs> I'll start from the prehistoric times. Um, so back in the day, I started as a uh, musician in choirs and I took private lessons, went to university for music, um, ended up starting my jazz career as a singer in the Southwest United States, uh, Santa Fe. And uh, I moved back to Canada about six, seven years ago, um, started as a jazz musician, specifically singer um, here in Toronto. And so um, during that time, I went through the clubs, theaters, um, a couple of festivals. Um, I recorded an album when I was in the States and that process is completely different than how I would record a, an album here with regards to funding. And so that's kind of where I come into this conversation. That is wonderful. And we're so glad you're here again. And Joy, can you give us a little bit of a background from you? My experience um, started, my music experience um, in terms of playing professionally started with steel pan. I uh, play the lead or tenor pan. I moved into composition and have done arranging in the um, community arts space within the education. Um, I've, I've worked with teachers in the school boards to help them to use steel pan to teach music, to promote teamwork and team building, and have done that work with clients like Harborfront um, in, in, in different spaces. My work has progressed into um, a, a lot of different things. I run, I have my own um, Afro-Caribbean jazz ensemble called the Joy Labs Project. So where that, in that regard, I'm finishing um, my fourth record, but this is my first full length album with my own composition. So we're kind of in the final stages of that. I'm also working on a, a, a production looking at the contributions of women to the steel band movement. So I, um, I'm in just starting that um, creation process. And uh, last fall, I produced my first, my, I've done different multi-arts production work, but my first one um, with choreography and um, steel pan composition and, um, and storytelling was uh, from Skin to Steel and Beyond, where I looked at the development of the steel pan from the skin drums to the um, the iron band, um, the, the um, you know the tambu bamboo, and just looking at that how that um, how that all comes together in terms of the steel pan that we that we know now and some of the electronic steel pans that we know. So my so my work right now I, I would say is is a lot of uh, it's just like working on my record for my group and also um, working on telling these stories through. Um, through music, through choreography, through poetry, and in more of a theater setting. Well, we'll see how theater settings look <laughs> in the next little while. Um, other than that, I sit on the board of the Toronto Mass Choir. And from a, an entrepreneurial perspective, my undergrad was in international business. I went to the Shula School of Business and studied international business and studied abroad in Paris for a little while. 
And um, my my dad was, is a financial planner, so he was always kind of, you know, getting trying to like instill some of that stuff in me. And and so the mix, my love for arts, my understanding of finance and business have kind of brought me to a place where um, between my husband and I, um, Larnell, I do a lot, like a lot of the business stuff. And I've also, sometimes I, 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 I kind of try to chase our other artist friends and tell them about why they need to do their taxes <laughs> and, and help, try to help them write grants. Um, and more recently, I actually did a, a seven part video series on personal finance for artists during COVID. So that's on my Instagram, if anybody wants to check that out. That's all. That's fantastic. So glad to have you on the show. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, I do have a question to start off. Uh, what options do we have for fundraising uh, organizations or ways that it can be generated? Let's think about different applications. I guess there are different applications, I should say, for some of those. So maybe talk about those. There's many ways we can fund. Um, uh, if we're looking at records, if, we're, if I'm thinking about the audience here, um, we can, there is grant funding, but there's also um, options to go through crowdfunding. We can look at private investors, um, look at patrons of the arts. We now have platforms like Patreon, where you can invite people to donate or um, contribute to your artistry on a monthly basis. Um, I've also seen your own investments in your music. Um, I think that's the first thing I'll say is really important to, to, to be being willing to make some sort of financial investment into your own um, productions. Hmm. Um, and, and then I've also seen people pre-sell their records to help fund their albums. Those are some of the things that I've seen. That's a really good uh, last one right there. The pre-sale, if you know that the album is going to happen, if you're in the works, then absolutely pre-sale. If you're hoping that it happens or don't have a plan, then then make sure that you're making uh, just responsible choices for the others and for you in terms of that investment. Um, I actually had experience with uh, crowdfunding. That was how I funded my first album. And um, it was it was intense. And so when it comes to asking people that support you to support this endeavor, you really want to try and have as big a pool as possible so that uh, you're, it, it's not all the heavy lifting for the people that are closest to you necessarily. Um, and also just realize that if you are going to be crowdfunding, you want to make sure that you're giving them something that will be of value if you're doing the tiered um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, gifting, essentially. So uh, that's really important. Um, honestly, uh, Joy, you listed all of the ones that are essentials, definitely. Um, the special thing about grants is that you have to qualify and it's very like you don't have any control over who's listening. You only have control over what you present. So it's not about relationship. It's not about uh, inspiration. It's really how many people are in the pool at that point in time and how your music moves them, how your application um, compels them to say, yes, there's potential here or this is, this is a, a sure thing. Let's get behind this. So those are some things to think about. So you raised some two very good points here. One was about pre-selling and crowdfunding. And I want to dig deeper a little bit more on that. On the crowdfunding sure. side, what mm -hmm. are some things like, um, I, I look at crowdfunding and go, it takes a lot of, pardon the pun, faith, faith. <laughs> you know, it just takes a uh -huh. lot of faith <laughs> to, to put a, a project out there and saying, pretty much saying, fund my project when mm -hmm. people don't know what they're getting. So what are some ways to, to that, that people can establish, if you call it a trust or an interest for people to, for, for people to invest, to actually put some money towards a project? What are some other thoughts you have? Um, so ideally the people that you're asking to support uh, are already supporters in some way or form. So either supporters of you as an individual, so that's when your personal connections come in, friends, family, colleagues, acquaintances um, of any kind. But uh, the ones that do extremely well online, um, at least in the past, uh, I'm not sure about right today, um, were the ones where the 
visual was strong, where the copy, which is the text, whatever's written on the particular page, was strong. Um, and sometimes we can't see the strength of something if we're personally invested in, if, we, if we're connected to it too closely. So sometimes you need a second pair of eyes to say, you know what, that might be your favorite picture, but it actually doesn't give, uh, tell the story that you want it to. It might not um, be uh, as professional looking as it needs to be for people to say, oh, this person has already invested in themselves. Yes, we're willing to invest in them. Um, so things like that, the video, um, what you say, the telling the story, oftentimes people are willing to get behind your story um, because they're moved um, by the emotion of it. And this is going into psychology, but people need to actually um, feel something when they experience you, whatever you put out there. So um, if your story is, uh, it doesn't have to be like a sob story. It doesn't have to be America's Got Talent, American Idol kind of like, <laughs> like it doesn't have to be crazy, but it needs to um, take people on, on a journey and they'll want to continue that journey on with you. Um, those are some things that that can really make the difference between a successful crowdfunding campaign and an unsuccessful one. Now, I know there's several types of crowdfunding. Which ones did you, did you find more successful? The big ones, uh, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, the big ones, they, you either have to get it completely funded by the timeline, because there's always a deadline, um, or if you get it funded partially, you'll still get the money. Um, and so there's kind of the added uh, pressure of, okay, well, yeah, well, let's really get her to this, to this deadline. Let's make sure that she gets it funded. Um, and I uh, found that that was the one where um, the amount that was raised is the amount that you would get. Um, and I chose that because um, there's kind of a letdown if you work and you work and you say, we're almost there. And then you don't make the deadline and then none of that money goes to you. I felt like that was like very deflating. So that's one of the big reasons I went with Indiegogo. Um, and, and you have to see what, what their track record is of success. So if you know, a certain percentage of people get their items funded um, through it, then that's probably a better way to go. Joy, mm -hmm. let's hear from you. you. You did not do crowdfunding. So which, which um, other ways of funding did you work with and find successful? In, in my first recordings, I invested personally um, and my, my parents invested personally. Um, and then my last recording that I did, I was able to get some creation funding from the, uh, from Factor as well as the, ter the Ontario Arts Council. And so this, this is through grant writing. I, I found it to be, I, I would say in that stage, because I was beginning to um, express myself as a composer and as a, as a creator in that sense, I found a, a good route to go was to start with smaller size fundings and starting with creation funding. Um, so for example, I, I think, so Factor, for example, this is um, the, it's a it's a national um, grant granting um, program in Canada, and at that time it was kind of like a demo grant, and now they call it an artist development grant. So, and the point that I'm trying to make is that I I was using this as a as a starting point. So I wasn't asking for big money, but it was enough to help me do something. So I I was able to um, record some music. And, and that kind of, those types of grants that help you do a little bit, maybe a, a home recording, it allows you to create really good quality recordings. And I believe that when you do that, you can use those, um, these materials to help get bigger grants or help to tell the stories that um, Faith was talking about. So now you have some good recordings um, that you can and put on your as a part of your Indiegogo campaign to tell people about you know what, what you've already done or to share on a Patreon or share in your social media to um, to kind of start to take them along the journey. In addition, I've been able to secure for this current project recording funding from the Ontario Arts Council and the Toronto Arts Council, and 
those were, I think, I think I definitely was able to use, so I, I did my first record, I did like the, my first record as a composer, I did kind of like an EPK or a, like a five track. And so those really good quality recordings helped me to get these bigger grants. And that along with, I, I got the support of a grant writer in, in earlier stages. And actually I got the support from a grant writer and that those grants that they weren't successful actually, but I always say it was the best investment I could have made because the person who wrote, who I worked with, she, um, she's been very successful in the music industry just in general. Um, and she helped me to craft my artist statement, which is a key thing that you need to have when I think when you're telling your story, when you are applying for funding. And um, so she helped me to craft that in a way that I didn't know the arts councils would want to see. And that was a, it was like, like I said, I was not successful with the grant that she helped me write, but I was able to use that, um, the framework to repurpose for other applications. Um, and mm. it's been very helpful. Is there any chance if you use more than one that you'll uh, be at risk uh, financially? Well, I think the thing to remember with funders, one of the things that they are looking for is diversity in your income sources. They, they, you, you rarely find grants. I don't know. There, there are not, there are not a lot of grants out there for outside of music um, and within music that say like, we're willing to fund a hundred percent of your project. They're looking to see that. I think the thing that they're looking to see is regardless of if we fund you, would you still go through with this project? Because I think it shows okay. a level of commitment. And they're also looking to see that because, because especially when it comes to music recordings, they're, all, it's, they're often very um, competitive programs. So I believe that they're also looking to see, you know, what if we can't fund you 100% of what you've asked for? Do you have other funding sources so that if we do choose you, would this project still be viable? If we were to choose you and fund you at 50% of what you asked us for, is this still viable? Um, and I think that's, so, and one of the things that I've, I've also done in term, as a, in addition to grant writing is I've sat on um, adjudication committees. So I've seen the thought process that, that kind of goes through. And that's a, that's one of the big things. It's like, you know, if your project is $10,000 and you're asking me for $8,000 and I, I'm looking at the expenses that you have, if I, if I want to still help you, but I can only give you $4,000, I want to see, okay, like, does she still have a little bit more? Does he, does he have a, still have a little bit more that can make this work? Because I might not, I may only have $4,000 to give you, but I might not give you that money if I can't see the viability of this project. Right. On what the, what this program is, is able to offer you. Does that make sense? You're, you're making me think, you're making me think of something, a question about mm -hmm. if there was three things that an artist was to consider when they're going into the um, looking at the options for fundraising, what were the three things that they might want to consider when looking for uh, a way to fundraise? I think timeline is really huge. So, and so my, for example, let's say you're going to record, you want to record in January or you want to record next year. I think that it's important to look at when are the deadlines and when are the responses for those deadlines? Mm -hmm. I think um, what I'm seeing now is within the arts councils specifically, I'm seeing that similar types of programs from different granting bodies are starting to have very close deadlines. Whereas they were kind of all over the place before. So you'll find that the Ontario Arts Council factor and Toronto Arts Council, they might have all of their recording um, competitions with similar due dates. So it's kind of nice because you're you're kind of in the frame of mind in your grant writing with a with very similar you're telling a very similar story. Some of them might be different in terms of what they want to to hear from from you. Um, so I think the timeline is good because at least if you say, okay, I'm going to apply in October, they're not going to get back to me until January. And now I know in January, I could potentially apply again if it wasn't successful. Cause I think that's the other piece, just because your application isn't successful with one panel, it doesn't mean that it isn't going to be successful with the next panel because the competition could be different and the panel could be different. And so you, it's a, it's a panel of your peers <laughs> and 
and your music might not re re um, resonate with the panel in the October deadline, but the exact same application might resonate with somebody in the February deadline. Same music, um, same, I think the same text, same everything, but it's different people seeing it. Potentially with the same project, you could the third time putting out the exact same project to the application actually get it. So really good point, Joy. Thank you. Um, I think a, a, a statement is really important to know what it is that you're trying to um, to do with this work. What are you about? What are you? What's the impact that you're trying to have? So I think it's being having a really clear idea, and even if you aren't necessarily the greatest at writing writing or crafting this um, very compelling story, to just know what you're trying to do. What is your sound? Um, who are the guests on your record? What is the um, what's the story of, of, of the record or the project that you're doing? Um, and I think it's really important to have a clear mission and to not allow that to drift because sometimes grant funding, pe sometimes people want to chase grant funding and, and sometimes the, fun, the, the, the program or the program initiatives or the program priorities might not be in line with what you're doing. So I think it's important to understand like what are the priorities of this program and that what you're trying to achieve are um, are in line with those priorities. Yeah, that's more than three, but that's awesome. <laughs> that's no, no, it's really good. That was those like three with yeah, that's point really A and B. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. So Faith, let's go back to you for a little while sure. uh, about the, the considering things uh, as an artist. What what things do I have to consider before I look for a funding or uh, a way to raise funds? I think you should probably find out, de decide who it is you are. So for example, there are all sorts of uh, eligibility uh, requirements. And if you're not someone that can uh, fit into those requirements that they've set, they're not changing it for you. <laughs> so if you don't fit into that, then it doesn't work. Um, for example, um, we could save in the factor. Um, there are certain there are certain uh, granting bodies that don't cater to beginning um, artists. So if you don't have a body of work, um, then you have to start with something that's potentially more local. So as Joy was mentioning, um, here in Toronto, we have the Toronto Arts Council. Um, there are cities across the country that have their local uh, municipal, like their city um, arts councils. And that's often the best place to start um, because they do give more of a shot um, for you to go on to bigger, uh, bigger things. Um, so who you are um, and point of view kind of goes into that. Identity is a big part of uh, what makes an artist stand out and in knowing your kind of unique identity, uh, even if you seem, if you, you feel like you're just like everyone else, you're not. <laughs> We're all created uniquely and we all uh, take in the same information differently. So um, what your point of view is with your music and if it's a matter of differentiating your uh, instrumentation. So if you have cello with uh, electric guitar and drums, uh, if that's your makeup, that could be something that's really appealing to someone um, in a granting body. Um, but also if you're huge on TikTok and all like the social medias, you could find yourself in a short amount of time raising the funds that you need because mm. you do have a reach, um, especially right now, like most of us are communicating primarily online. Like, I don't know about y'all, it's for me, it's a good 90, 95%. Um, so reaching people um, where they are um, in terms of crowdfunding, it could be one of the best times to be doing that. So, um, so knowing who you are um, and if you're actually eligible um, knowing if you have the, the reach to be able to crowdfund um, in terms of finding funding. Usually it's the grants that have uh, stipulations as to how much you can or can't. Um, if you have to finish and report, yes, this is how I spent your previous $5,000 in order to get the next $5,000. Um, because if you, if they can't prove that you've used it well in past, then 
trusting you with a, another allotment of money is, is not as likely. Um, but private investors, so uh, people who are willing to be more like patrons and actually um, give you money because they want you to succeed and they're not worried about how many other people are helping. It's just a matter of the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, in those personal instances, I don't think they usually are concerned about how much other funding or where the other funding is coming from. I'm not sure, what do you think, Joy? So if we're talking about funding broadly, I, I do know that there's some bodies that only allow you to have a certain percentage of public funding, for example. Um, and as Faith mentions, there's sometimes, there's sometimes limits on how many applications that you can submit. Time limits and yeah, financially, yeah. yeah. And there's also, there's, I think, I think it's always great to just to diversify um, because if one doesn't work out, if one can't fund at a hundred percent of what you're asking, then I think it's always helpful. And, but I think you have to just remember who your audience is because the questions that I, I find that the arts councils are more open to, this is very artistic and this is very, <laughs> I like, like I feel so moved artistically. Whereas bodies like Factor or um, the Ontario Music Fund are like, tell me about your viability. Tell me about how many albums you can sell. Have you charted on the radio? You know? And so I think it's just important to understand who your audience is. And also I think, given the platform that we're on, it's also important to understand the messaging that you're sending and which bodies are supporting that type of messaging. Because I know when you look at um, the, the Toronto Arts Council, the OAC, um, the Canada Council, you're often asked to find declarations about um, what is the work environment look like? What does, um, what are you, what do you, like what ideas or, um, are you putting forth in the music and does it um, exclude any, any persons for different reasons? And you have to be able to say, okay, um, what, again, what is my vision? What is my story? What do I stand for? Can I sign on to that? And know that you have to be able to, if you sign that dotted line, then you have to be able to, um, you have to be able to, um, to live, to, to, to do what you, what you've said you were going to do. So there's, I think there's something for everyone. You just have to understand, understand your, your, um, the body, the funding body and understand your audience, understand your message and make sure that they're in alignment. This is great. I, for those of you who are just tuning in right now, we are here at the Hub Online. We are speaking about raising funds for your musical project or your arts project. And we are here with Joy Lapps. Uh, Lewis, who is a composer and an arts and <laughs> academic educator. Is that the right way to say that? And Faith Amore, who is our uh, recording artist in Toronto. She's also a jazz uh, composer and a marketing um, consultant for other artists. There are some questions that have been popping up from the audience. I wanted to get those in before uh, I, I lose track here. Um, one question that came up is just to clarify again about being diverse with your income stream. I know you've mentioned a few things which were uh, the possibility of, of uh, approaching different, um, like the grants and the different organizations. And I think earlier you said about self-investing. To put it very simply, to like, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. So don't, ex and, and, and what I mean when I say that is, let's just say you have a project a recording project, it's $10,000. First of all, a lot of the grant funders are not gonna fund your project at 100%. So you'll see in the guidelines, they'll say, we'll, we'll fund up to $10,000, but only up to 50% of the project costs. And then there's only certain project costs that they're going to fund. So they might, so if you wanna have a guest that's from the US, they might be a Toronto or an Ontario based funder and they're saying we wanna fund um, music industry professionals that are from the region that we're funding. Um, and so, sorry, back to this question around diversifying. What I'm saying is you want to look at your budget and say, if I need $10,000, maybe I should try to get five from here, four from here, and maybe I'm going to put 1,000 in. And that way, 
if you're not successful with one application or with one funder or with one funding stream, you can still potentially um, carry out your project, maybe at a smaller scale, um, or you can at least start your project and get some really important um, material like audio or video that can help to um, the subsequent funding steps that you need to take. Now, I want to bring it back um, to a project that we have instigated. We've been telling some of some people, or sometimes we've said it in other episodes, that we've put forth a project, a challenge actually, to some artists to actually write Christmas music so that we can put it together in a compilation project, <laughs> music project, I guess. So, um, so there are artists out there right now that are writing songs um, some of them have gone ahead and they've already arranged to get recordings and there are some that may be writing, but they don't know what to do next. So you, you ladies have said a lot of different things that I think are very important. Um, one that I was going to ask is a plan. And I know Faith, you're a marketing person. So how important is it for an artist to have a marketing plan? I think it's important for artists, for everyone to have a plan for any and everything that they want to succeed. Um, the Bible talks about that too, you know, uh, write the vision, make it plain, um, and it's more likely to happen. Um, so yeah, I think that the marketing plan can kind of happen as early as you want it to happen. Um, and ideally, you're marketing as you're doing the creation as you're doing it. You're not trying to create something random. It's along the way you can say, okay, well today I'm getting down to the, the lyrics of this first song. This is the first day guys, you know, just like come along with me on this journey. The plan is to have five songs by the end of the week, ah! you know, just like making people a part of the experience. Um, but, um, but yeah, so a marketing plan I think is absolutely important, but also a plan for how you'll, do every step, um, including how you'll get the money to actually produce the, the final work. Thank okay. you. And I know that when I say marketing plan, some people get really, really, really scared, right? So it can be intense. I mean, it can be, uh, it can be a, you know, multi-page uh, endeavor, but it can also be, uh, I'm going to go live on Instagram every Monday from one to two and I'm going to engage with my fans and I'm going to um, let people know what I'm doing so that when I do eventually ask them if they want to be a patron on Patreon or to crowdfund um, or, you know, pre-sale of, of whatever the, uh, the project is, then they're not, it's not just selling to them all of a sudden. Um, you've kind of given them a chance to be part of what you're doing and then this is just an extension of that. So it's not a big leap. It's not as big a leap. Yeah. That's kind of cool. So it's engaging your fan base right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Instead of, so I did a thing uh, and you should be excited about it as much as I am. And it'll cost you 20 bucks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my email address to PayPal me. <laughs> right. Mm. And that's often what we, we end up doing. Um, and so sometimes the, I mean, what we're doing with granting organizations is we're telling them, they're, they're giving us the money oftentimes at the beginning, but they want us to tell the story after to justify what they gave. Um, but sometimes it's the flip side. We tell them, we take them, we show them, and then it kind of justifies it. So, so this is what it is. And if you uh, want to support, if you want to continue to support, this is another way to do it. So I feel like that's a whole nother conversation, but, uh, but yeah, that, those are my thoughts on that. Joy, what's your thought on all that? I think that um, if you feel a little bit overwhelmed by the idea of a marketing plan, um, I think the first thing to come to terms with is depending on where you sit in <laughs> um, I think regardless of where you sit, whether you are strictly a songwriter, if you're a songwriter and, and an artist, I think there's some element of um, business planning that has to happen. And a business plan is incomplete without a marketing section. 
Mm -hmm. And so I think um, it's something to just come to terms with <laughs> if you are doing this work. So if you're a songwriter, you might be pitching your work to artists, but there's still some element of thinking, um, what, like, what do I offer? And who am I, who would be interested in this? So who am I targeting? Um, and I think it's just important to do if you, and if you feel, for example, um, we just submitted a, a JSR grant um, on behalf of Larnell and we use the factor marketing plan guide. Um, we were going to seek out professional support for it, but we felt like, you know, seeing that nobody knows what's happening in the industry right now, yeah, it yes. may be unwise to, to um, let's wait for things to settle a little bit. Yeah. Um, but they actually have a, a, a template. So even if you're not ready to market your record, um, you can actually just go on their website and they kind of give you an outline and it's very specific and it, uh, it, and it asks you the questions and just by answering those questions you're kind of you're doing that work it'll ask you um who is the artist how many songs who's the target market based on the target market what are the platforms you'll be using you know on social media or other forms of media um you know and the, the nice thing about marketing plans is that we live in a world now where we have more access to marketing data. Um, I encourage you, if you're in school, or if you know someone that's in school, there's so much data available and information through university libraries or even just your public library. So if you're just looking for music industry data, you can find that. And what some of the nice things about social media is that you can also check your own data and check your own analytics. So if you have a business page on Instagram or on Facebook, you can check and see what are the ages of people that are engaging and, and liking your content. And you can start to um, change the direction of who is listening to who's watching that. Or you can say, it seems like these people are really interested. They're touched by what I do. Let me continue to be intentional about reaching these people. So yeah, click through analytics <laughs> <laughs> and you can learn a lot. What's so interesting about that is that, um, so with Facebook, Instagram, um, the business page, uh, if you're a musician, is typically your band page. It's the same thing. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of information there that uh, you can be helping people to find you and maybe they've been looking for you, maybe looking for your music, looking for um, something that connects with them. And so, uh, yeah, the business side, it, we we don't have labels that are doing all of this for people um, the same way that they used to and there's still most musicians won't be on a label they need to do it themselves and so this is the independent musician this is the entrepreneur this is a uh, the hustle <laughs> that you have to do to to move things forward in your music career uh you're the, you're the one that's going to do it so um so if you're willing to take that on uh, if you're making music and you want it to be heard then the, the business side is important and learning to market is super important and uh, figuring out how that can go in size with your funding essential very true we uh we covered a lot of things so far everybody who's watching right now um we talked about um different types of methods for fundraising and what might apply to you might not apply to others and um, I liked the, uh, just to review a little bit of what um, the story aspect, I think it was uh, Faith was talking, no, it was uh, Joy was talking about uh, the story, having the story to establish a story to uh, be able to um, connect with your uh, potential um, people who want to sponsor, you want to buy into you as a person in your story. And uh, Faith was talking about identity, uh, realizing who you are and your music and making that um, you know, relatable to your audience as well. So you've got some really good points with, with uh, as, as, a, as an individual, uh, in which way you would ta maybe tackle this whole question of how do I raise funds? Another thing I was thinking about was um, when an, an artist should consider looking for funding options in different areas, recording uh, process, um, the artist development process, as we talked about, there's some um, grants that you can get. Now, um, when, when looking at a marketing plan, how does somebody who doesn't have any understanding about what that means, how can they go about starting a marketing plan? Because it, it's going to be that, that place that people, they're, they're creative, but they don't have the, you know, that 
mindset to say a lot of planning. I don't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. What kind of advice would you give? Yeah, I'll start. I, I think that um, Google is your best friend. That is <laughs> what I honestly, I don't know how people lived before the age of the Google. What, I, uh, what I've been doing uh, over the last couple of years, um, I've been Googling every question that I have and there are always dozens of, of answers, many of them um, reiterating the same things. So um, if you want to not go to a, a source, like um, Joy was mentioning that Factor actually has a marketing plan there for you as, an, as a template that you can walk through. But if you didn't even know Factor existed, or if you don't know all of, all of the bodies that uh, kind of help to curate some of that information, then yeah, then absolutely go to the Google. Um, also on there, there are programs that you can use that are uh, marketed online. So for example, maybe a, a six week program to, um, to explode your uh, Instagram following or like there's, there's different online programs, people who have done the grunt work, tried and failed, figured out what works for them and then they've packaged it um, and they sell it as a product. Now, uh, right now it's not the easiest to, to, grab a hold of some of those um, just because finances are everywhere for people. You, you never know what it, uh, if people can afford that right now in this particular period of life of, uh, of the world. But um, there are a lot of groups that have special COVID discounts, to be honest. Um, up until yesterday, um, there was a company called Open Studio that had uh, jazz lessons, I'm, I'm a jazzer, um, for pay what you can, essentially. So if you are motivated um, to find those organizations and those deals, then there's sometimes a shortcut to figuring out the business side of things because people have figured it out. As far as marketing goes, I think um, between what I shared before around like the templates um, and what, what Faith has talked about in terms of Google, I'm the same. You know, I'll, I, I, I grab the factor template, then I'll Google other templates for marketing. I have a business background, so it's easier for me to flesh through what makes sense, right. um, you know, and what doesn't. But I think she, she said something really important was when you start to see the same answer come up constantly, there's probably some, <laughs> some, some truth there. Um, and I think that from a marketing perspective, the thing that I would say is really important is to think about your warm contacts. And so a lot of times we're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm trying to build this audience way across the sea, you know, but I start off with the people that like you and they don't even have to like your music. They just like you <laughs> and, and let them, um, and, and there, there will always be a few people who, um, who genuinely love what you do and they will share that. So, Create content that is shareable, that, um, that, you know, that people can, can, um, whether it's, you know, sometimes people are sending, you know, YouTube videos through WhatsApp or sharing stuff on their Facebook pages or on Instagram. So I think, um, helping your audience to share your message is important, but definitely I would say to start with those warm contacts. And I would also say that it's important to build followings online, but to really see how you can own your audience. And I I put that in quotations in the sense that um, if you can bring them over to your newsletter or make sure that you have direct access to them outside of the social media platform, because if Instagram evaporated tomorrow or if Facebook evaporated tomorrow, you don't want to, you won't, you won't want to have lost, you know, your 4,000 followers that you worked so hard to build. Absolutely. Um, the, there are some sites, uh, that were social media platforms, so Musical.ly, Vine, um, where people had, you know, up to millions of, of followers, um, and then overnight, the companies kind of just said, we're not doing this anymore for any number of reasons, and they were devastated, their finances were devastated, um, and they had to start again on a different platform, but um, what Joy's ultimately saying is the email address is key. Um, because that's how you connect with people. Uh, m- snail mail. I, I don't even, I forgot that was a thing. Um, 
So yeah, email addresses um, are key because that's how you can get, I mean, people read their emails. So, I'm sorry, sorry guys. Um, but yeah, people read their emails um, and uh, it's a personal connection. You can have your voice. You're not limited to 140 characters, you know? Um, and if other things go away, that's really, that's the connection. Especially now, we're not seeing each other. So that's one of the closest touch points that we have. I think yeah. that's a very good point because it is very easy with all the social media um, avenues that, that are available. Like you said, there's, there's, you know, the, the, the faithfuls, I guess you want to call it. That, <laughs> old faithful. <laughs> the old faithfuls, which are the Facebooks, the uh, YouTubes, the inter Instagrams. Now there's TikTok and, you know, there's a few other ones that are there that have come up that are becoming more popular mm -hmm. for audiences to use. But, like you said, those are touch points where people can see, but they're not necessarily connected beyond seeing them on those social media bits. Mm -hmm. By collecting the email addresses and actually having an, having that extra step, that extra email makes a difference. Um, I remember hearing from from a very successful person. He, he wasn't he was a musician, but he actually got successful at doing something else. And his, one of his touch points, one of his, his advice to everybody was grow your email. Your email list is key to, mm. to everything. Like yeah. once you have an email list, you can, you can communicate with your fans. You can uh, let them know what you're up to and mm -hmm. they become your warm contacts. Like now he, he his way Absolutely. of saying it is you make a lot of money. That's was his thing. But, you know, <laughs> that was his bottom line. But, but yeah. really, it's if you have the email addresses, you're basically saying you basically have those warm contacts through which you can start saying, hey, guys, this is what we're doing now. I, I have a, a GoFundMe or I have a, a Kickstarter. I have an Indiegogo. I have this 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 project that's coming up and we're so excited about it. And like you said, we can take them through that journey. So I think that's really, yeah. really awesome. That's how um, we keep people in the loop uh, in personally. Right. And so it's like, I'm talking to you. So yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Emails I just want to add to, to this um, point that Faith has just brought up is that I think we use this word marketing, but a lot of the times the, the word that comes with that is communication and and I would add to that connection. And I think that um, it's, it's, it is business and, you know, we're trying to build a living, but I think we're also trying to impact people. And I think if we are, we find a way that we can genuinely touch and reach out to our listeners, I think there's a lot of value in that for you and for them. And so I, and I think that we all, sometimes people talk about, um, you know, yes, we want to bring people to our, to email so we don't lose. There's no way that we lose that connection. But I think that we should also remember, like, what is, what is unique about us? And I know that, you know, some, you know, I know Faith, you said snail mail. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> um, but I, what I would say is, to, I would say is that, um, to, again, to go back to your audience, go back to your faithful audience and see, like, what is most meaningful for them? Because sometimes it's about, investing in like that those 20 or 25 people or 100 people and saying i'm gonna put a christmas card in yeah. the snail mail for you to yeah. get it you know yeah. and that yeah. depending on who they are that might mean the world to them you know but you could also record a video a personalized video message and that might mean the world to them and i think it's just remembering like um how do you connect with that person what's meaningful and what's unique to you like how are you unique and how can you do that um, you know, in, in your own unique way, in your own unique voice. Yeah, marketing and communications is very, very important, especially for someone who's starting. Um, I guess when you get the ball rolling, things are a little easier for you. Uh, PR is one of the things we used to talk about years ago, not so much touched about now, personal relations. There's an individual mm -hmm. who's on your uh, marketing strategy or who's on your pay, who's doing the PR, they're doing the radio, they're doing all this stuff. Now, a lot of, a lot of artists um, who are just starting up don't have those resources. I get that. Um, uh, so you kind of have to wear all these different hats, really. And it's, it's a challenge, yeah. especially for young upcoming artists. Is, is there anything that you ladies maybe want to say to, to people out there who are thinking about, um, oh, I, I, may, I need some income to make this happen. What, what are the things you may want to leave with them that you may not have touched on at this point? I'll go first. Um, 
when it comes to the formal grants, um, my, my biggest point is to not be afraid of them. Honestly, I was kind of terrified and procrastinated for a good three, four years. Um, and I'm not the only one. I know that for a fact. So many people um, just think that it couldn't make it, they could never get a grant. Um, and there are a lot of people who have put out numerous applications and still haven't received one. And um, it's a challenge, but I feel like you have to do it um, because one of the things it does is gets you super, super clear on what you're, what you're doing, what your mission is, what your, um, your mission statement, who you are, um, how much it costs to do things. The questions you have to ask, you have to find out if the instrumentalists are available. Um, like she was saying, timeline. There's just a lot that it makes you process. And sometimes those are questions that we've never asked ourselves. So, um, so the process of doing a grant is super, um, illuminating uh, for you as in your own personal growth as an artist. Um, and it's not as scary as, as you think uh, if you've never done it. Um, and that's what I realized when I, I finally got down and said, okay, I'm going to do this. Uh, the application is due in five days and I, I'm just going to do it. And then, so you focus in, you, you read the questions you only answer what's being asked. You don't need to add anything flowery. Just be authentic. Let, um, they want to know who you are individually, what you'll bring um, to Canadian music scene. Like these are, the, these are the kinds of things that they want to see and hear. Um, and that you have a plan, and that you've thought it through. And if, you're, and if you're unclear, then by the end of it, you'll get clear. Um, even if you never send it in, but I do suggest that after all that work that you send it in, um, but just do it, uh, read all the, like, read and then do it. That's the main thing I would say. Just uh, do it. Just, just do it. Just do it, Maya. Just, just, yeah. That's great. What about you, Joy? What's maybe, yeah. <laughs> what are you, Joy, any last thoughts? Um, th those are great points that, that um, Faith Put out there i would say just to be clear about your mission and your goals and i would say and just be really clear and intentional about them and be willing to move forward on them funding or not because i think um i think that's important to because I, you should never you never want to not do a project because you're not going to get the funding if that's the if that's the attitude that I think it, it's, it should be maybe I can't do it just yet. I still plan on doing it. I may have to spend more time working um, or finding another source of income, but I think it's important to want to do projects that you can fund. I think it's important to um, let your art be at the center. So spend time making sure that whatever it is you're presenting, those examples, they're always gonna ask for artistic examples. Um, make sure that they're as, as good as they could possibly be. And also just because like, that's why we're here. We're, we're here to, to, to create, create. Um, whatever, whatever your art form is. Um, if you apply and you're not successful, and even if you are successful, I would always encourage you to contact the grant officer and get feedback because the, the, they often, most panels will write down, you know, various feedback. Um, Remember that even in a time right now, like we're um, before, but I think even more now, we're moving into a time where people are becoming more conscious of issues around equity. So there are grants that you can access based on the fact that you are a woman or that you're indigenous or that you are black or that you have a disability, for example. And and it's not to say that you should just, um, it's, it's more to say that we recognize that people that have been traditionally marginalized don't have the same access. I would say, look, look at those things. Um, and, um, and if you can, um, perhaps spend some time maybe sitting on a grant. Like if you've been doing music for a long time, adjudicating grants is a great way to understand them and, and how they work. Um, and I would say at the end, make, make sure and make sure you understand the program priorities. Um, yeah, those are, I think those are some of the main points that I would, that I would add. 
and don't give up. <laughs> if we're looking, if we're looking at music recording, remember that um, if you're a writer, don't forget about so can. If we're looking at music recording, um, remember that those are often very competitive programs. So if you need some support, it's not just music recording. So for an example is, um, I got a grant in professional development. So I went and I studied with, I went to Paris, I studied with a mentor in my field to develop my ability as a composer and arranger. And so um, that's a great way to build your skills, but you might not be able to fund your projects specifically, but you can still grow. So look, look at other areas like professional development, or perhaps there are grants to help you with the marketing aspect of a record, but your record itself might not get funded. So don't just say, I'm just looking at the recording grant. Again, come back to like, what is it that you're trying to achieve? You know, a, a platform like this is a great example. Like if you are out there and you've decided, I wanna help this specific part of the industry develop or share information, there are grants to help build industry and support industry. You don't have to just go for the recording grant. So I <laughs> see your face. So just, but again, let it be centered around, you know, what is it that you, that's been, that's been put in your heart to, to do and, and, and stay with that and then see what can help you along the way. That's what yeah. I'm that Nobody else saw my face because it was quiet, but <laughs> uh, it's like, oh, <laughs> I got a tingly feeling. Yeah. That is awesome. Uh, Lady, wow. It's been absolutely awesome having you here. There's been so much information. I'm pretty sure as people watch this video over and over again, questions are going to come up. So um, are you ladies okay with us bringing questions to you uh, even after the broadcast is done? And because there are people going to be wanting answers. They're going to want some advice from you. You cool Absolutely. with that? Yeah. That's a yes. Um, I, I reached out to some of my artists uh, and uh, colleagues um, to see if there was anyone who was willing to support grant writing, um, either for uh, a fee or just uh, casually. Um, and so some of those names are Chelsea McBride, Jordana Zahava, Cat Bird, Chris Nufong, Chris Hockley. Um, so uh, we'll talk about how to make those uh, grant writing supports available um, to your viewers. That's very, awesome. very cool. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Cool. That's awesome. That, well, it is that time again where we are going to, um, um, I guess, bring this to a close. But we want to again thank our wonderful panelists, Faith Amor, and oh, I have a French accent with that. Eh? Joy Laps Lewis, thank you, ladies, so much. You've imparted so much um, information yeah. that's been valuable and I don't think was even scary. Like, I thought it would be scary <laughs> yeah. stuff because, you know, as an artist, you know, when we hear business, it's like, oh, that's just, oh, we don't want to stay, we can talk about it. But you guys made it so, or ladies made it so. Um, approachable like it's like yeah just know yeah. where you're at know what you've got know your identity hey it's kind of cool maybe just do some yeah. videos and just hey you know it's kind of cool <laughs> like, like, just yeah. like I, I just really I really appreciate I, re I appreciate the fact that they're coming from a point of they've done the work themselves and it's not like they've just heard about it so there's an application here that's uh, appropriate for anyone who's listening that's in the industry or trying to get something together this there's practical stuff to help you out and we're so glad you guys are able to be here uh, on this panel. And for those of you who are watching right now, there's a reason why you're watching this. There really is. So we hope you can take these resources that are available in the GMI Hub TV on, on YouTube and you can check out all the videos. And I um, wanna thank you so much for joining us tonight, for viewing and for uh, my lovely panelists. I'm the odd guy out here. I'm the only guy, it's three against one all night long. It's been a blessing, it really has. First thing. And we also want to remind our viewers that next week we are back again. It's going to be Studio Talk with hosts Daryl Duick and myself. Um, so we are going to look forward to having you come uh, back with us. And then a week after that, we don't want to forget that we are going to be talking about songwriting, specifically about lyric writing and rhythm and who best to even talk about that or to even disclose that than people who are specially gifted in rap. We've got Drew Bex from Toronto. We've got Chris Oust from Vancouver. 
and we have Corbin, uh, sorry, John Corbin, I believe also from Toronto, who are going to be here. They all teach, they all do rap, they teach rap, but they have a heart and they have a heart for that. And we're going to talk to them about how they get their tongues around all those words when they are speaking. So um, we hope you tune in with us. That is in two weeks. So next week, studio talk. And then the next, following week after that will be songwriting. But for now, we want to say thank you for joining us. And thank you, Dale, for being our lovely host as well. <laughs> <laughs> like my new outfit? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and we will see you oh. all next week, Monday. Have a good week, guys. Thanks for having us. <laughs>